Welcome to SB Talks. Today is Friday, the 20th of January 2023, and myself uh, and Ashley Owen will once again be running a rule over the world and what this year has in store. Welcome, Ashley. Welcome, Vincent, and all of you out in uh, investor land, wherever you are in the world. Now, Ashley, uh, we enter the new year with uh, some increasing, slightly increasing optimism in terms of um, the possibility of a soft landing. Possibly the central banks aren't going to have to go quite as hard on rate increases, but really at this stage, because we haven't had a January meeting in Australia or in the US, it's, it's, it's largely speculation and probably a bit of a divergence between the equity market and the bond markets in terms mm. of what they are currently pricing. Yes, now shares globally uh, uh, down uh, from this this time, early January last year, global shares indexes are down 20-ish percent uh, mm. for the 2022 year for a variety of reasons. Mainly it was just a fluff blowing off all the, the, the silly tech stuff over the last uh, three, four, five years. Um, and plenty of technology but, names down 50% yes, plus all even all the Apples larger. and Microsofts mm. and Facebooks and Teslas, they're all down 50-odd. Uh, percent on last year, and they're still not they're still not cheap. They're still trading on price earnings ratios of twenty plus, uh, in some cases, you know, fifty, mm. sixty, eighty plus, uh, which is still assuming that thirty percent growth forever, which is nonsense. Um, so share markets are down, uh, and it's still not got them back to even fair price globally, let alone cheap yet. So potentially uh, more to come, and what will trigger that will be a lot of rate hikes, uh, mm. particularly if, uh, if they trigger recessions in the US, Europe, uh, Japan, Australia. Um, so in the last, January is always a good month for US shares, almost always. People get their bonuses, a lot of rollovers, a lot of, put, a lot of people put money in the share market just to top up, uh, to rebalance, plus bonus money goes in, portfolio managers are away, so the volume is very really light, there's no depth in the market, so share prices almost always rise in January. Um, so there's a January effect in the US market, not so much in Australia, but Australia, the rest of the world just lifts its confidence in January uh, is positive in the US. So that's um, if you discount the January effect, things are things haven't really changed much. It, you, say, it, you, you talk there predominantly about US shares. Would you differentiate the value level in Australia versus the US? Well, yes. The whereas share markets in the US, driven by the top ten tech names, are which, down, which completely dominate their, their share index. Now. That's right. Yeah. So they're down twenty five percent. So and globally, the share markets, because the US is sixty plus percent of the global market, that's also dragged the global market down fifteen odd percent last year. Um, Australia is down less. Uh, if you look at the three big sectors. The banking sector was dead flat for the year. Mm -hmm. Comback was up and the other banks are down a bit, but they're basically dead flat for the year, which is good in relative terms globally. They are reasonably cheap, but they're not priced in a recession here yet. So they're, they're not bad value, the banks, uh, without going into financial advice. Mm -hmm. Relative to the rest of the world, banks are not bad value. Um, the mining sector, which is the other third of the market in Australia, or another third of the market in Australia, they had not a bad year. The, uh, the fossil fuel fiends did well because oil and gas prices are up and coal prices are up. Most industrial metals, metals were flat or down for the year because of the global slowdown and the China lockdown. So the miners basically as a group did well. They were up you know, 10 odd percent as a group in Australia. Uh, and that lifted the market to be pretty much square in Australia relative to the rest of the world, which is down 10, 15, 20 percent last year. So pricing wise, the Australian market didn't have the silly tech fluff in it that the US market had well, last year. Well, we just don't have many of those types of businesses in it. Really. We haven't. We've got better the afterpays, yeah. you know, some nothing stocks like that. But basically, we haven't got the Facebooks and Teslas and Apples and Googles and Microsofts, etc. So we haven't got those in Australia. So our market didn't have those. We didn't get dragged down by those. So basically held up. Um, some other markets, UK was quite good because it had uh, a lot of oil and gas stocks, the BPs and Shells are in the UK, mm. uh, they held up as well. But by and large, most of Europe's down, most of Japan is down, and Australia is wasn't overpriced to start with and is probably fairly priced at the moment Yeah. versus the US, which is still overpriced. So you said a scene there where January has just been broadly positive for equity, modestly positive for equity markets, but... Different things happening in the bond market right now. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the the share market is predicting, even though it's down heavily last year, it is still predicting a soft landing because pricing is still expensive, and therefore people are still assuming that the rate hikes are about to end or will end soon, and there'll be no uh, mass bankruptcies and layoffs which accompany a, a deep recession. 
Um, so share markets have been reasonably benign in assuming no hard landing, no major traumas in economics in economies around the world, um, particularly US, UK, Japan, Europe. Bond markets are saying the opposite. Bond markets, which is bigger and uglier and more deep and longer mm. and bigger history than the, the share market, the bond market, which is where governments and corporates and households borrow money, bond markets have been, over the last three or four weeks since Christmas, basically uh, seen a flood of money into them. So the bond markets are assuming that there will be deep recessions mm. in even in Australia. I mean, the bond the, the, the ten year bond in Australia went from four odd percent, four point oh five percent at the end of the year, now to like three thirty, which is a mm. massive collapse in yields, which means there's a flood of money going into bonds on the assumption that they will do well in a recession. So even though it's only three weeks and no one's in town, everyone's on mm. holidays, so there's no real decision makers. Reserve banks are out um, for the summer. The markets are coming in there to say, well, 4% was overdone. We, we're happy to pick up uh, yes. on some bonds at that rate. Yes, yeah, so US 10 year bonds were 4.3 no, six months ago. Mm. Now they're 3.3. That's a massive collapse in yield, which means there's a massive flood of money not only into shares, but into bonds. Uh, where is it coming out of? Money's coming out of commercial property. A lot of people are seeing downgrades in commercial property globally, in the US particularly. So a lot of money's coming out of commercial property, uh, which is putting a pressure on valuations there. It's and probably a lot into, in cash on the sidelines as well. A lot in cash. With, with, in, cash. Particularly internationally when yields were, were, were nothing for a long time. Yep. Um, but that is... Also, people, if that money's coming to bonds and that money's coming to bonds and happy to buy and hold at those yields, you know, we've got the equity markets chasing or hoping for the, the narrow path to a soft landing, which is, you know, basically no recession or, or negligible recession. And the bond markets then te- t- really telling a different story. You know, mm-hmm. if you're happy to buy at those yields or see interest rates, yields in those bonds come down as much as they have, that's saying, well, we think there's a more than meaningful chance here that that there is going to be a, a bit of an ugly recession. Um, it, yes, it's right. So jobs, uh, yesterday the jobs numbers mm. came out in Australia, unemployment 3.5%, which is still, you know, 50, mm. 60 year low. So job market's very tight. Um, and there was numbers that the RBA or the ABS put out in December to suggest that the average Aussie uh, has got at least, you know, one or two jobs running Mm. Uh, so there's plenty of work for people who want to find it in, in, in aggregate anyway. Mm. So US is very strong. Yes, US jobs market is also holding up very, very strong, well. you know, 3.5% unemployment. So uh, the US GDP, economic pie, contracted for the first two quarters of last year, which is normally how the economists define a recession. Uh, they didn't define it as a recession because jobs are very strong and spending is very strong. Mm. This time around, a few things are different. We have seen mass layoffs in tech names. Uh, all of you know, everyone from Apple down is laying off staff big time by tens of thousands, uh, and all the silly profitless startup that you know they're either gone or going or will disappear very soon. So the jobs are coming out there, but the rest of the economy, the real economy, is actually doing quite well. Um, the, the elephant in the room is rate hikes and in particular mm. highly leveraged households and companies. So I can see, and also emerging markets, a lot of emerging markets, governments and corporates borrowed US dollars. Mm. US dollars been rising, was up 10% last year and interest rates are rising from you know yeah. zero to 4%, 5%. So their repayments so, are getting dramatically more expensive. A lot of companies uh, and and emerging market small country governments borrowed in US dollars on a floating rate, and that was a problem in the in the early 80s with the Latin debt crisis. It was mm. a problem in the uh, in the Asian crisis in the 90s. In the 90s. And it's going to be a problem now because everyone's got far too much debt, and they've got much more debt than they had the, the last couple mm. of debt cycles. So that simple fact of massive debt loads that they've never had before, several times the previous debt crises, plus rising US dollar. And rising U.S. interest rates on those dollars means somebody, you know, uh, you know, manufacturer in the back of Indonesia, for example, is paying um, six, seven, eight percent uh, on their floating rate debt in U.S. dollars. The U.S. dollars risen fifteen percent, plus mm. the interest rate has gone from six to ten percent on their particular yeah. corporate loan. So that that drives their payments up by about forty, fifty percent. So you're talking to the potential for distress, essentially, is is that's, high. That's that's the risk. Um, who knows what the trigger might be, but it's a tinderbox because of just so much debt is held by households, corporates and governments around the world now. So one thing, it could trigger a debt crisis of that nature. Mm-hmm. 
The second problem is going to be that in a recession or a downturn where there's mass layoffs and job losses and bankruptcy in corporate and personal level, which happened, by the way, in 2020, government threw money at it. Yeah. That's already done and the government is sitting on that debt. So mm. most governments in the world, not Australia, because Australia's got this mining boom, which is pure windfall out of China, most governments in the world, including US and Europe and Japan, have not a lot of capacity to borrow more next time mm. and throw money at jobs mm. like they did two or three years ago. So that's something so that's the UK, now. So the UK already tried that and, and the market said no a few months ago. Yes. So that and other, other governments will take, take heed on that. That's right. Um, I guess we're in an interesting time, so you touched on it there before. Um, last year, 2022, this, the, the, the story was we have to actually get interest rates back from zero to some sort of normal range, and it had to be very aggressive because just how far they had to lift from zero back yep. into a normal range. Um, we, to a degree, done that in Australia and in the US in terms of the two, two major markets that affect us. We then have this pause, no no meetings in, in January um, from the February the first couple of weeks of Feb, we'll see Australia and then the US meet mm. again. Mm. Do do we then foresee Australia has already probably eased, started to ease its level of increases? And in what does the Fed do? Is how how far will that go? And, um, and we're hearing all sorts of messages, strong messages from the Fed potentially that they want to just keep going. Yes, the the the, the key question is is inflation. Uh, mm. What are the numbers and what's in it and how sticky is it going to be? So, inflation in the US peaked at around nine percent. Um, six months ago, five, six months ago, and the headline numbers come down to about uh, 6%, fraction mm-hmm. under 7%. Um, so it sounds good. Uh, a lot of that was created by, a lot of the inflation initially was created by oil prices flowing through to the pump prices, which which jumped dramatically last year. They're coming down. Mm-hmm. So a lot of those, um, for a, lot, a few reasons, is seasonal is whether there's the supply chains opening up and there's Russia sanctions and people you know, like Europe is now borrowing and buying LNG from Australia. Mm-hmm. For, you know, so people are finding other ways around the problem. They will be solved in time, uh, one by one, some by luck, some by good management, some by just people opening doors again like China. Um, so a lot of the large parts of that inflation number, you know, 10% in Europe, 10% in the UK, 7% here, 9% in the US down to 7%, a lot of that, probably half of that will disappear in time in the mm-hmm. next six months without anything, anything, um, any more rate rises. At the same time, the six, seven rate rises we've had in, the, in, the, in Australia, we haven't really seen that filter through to mortgage prices and mortgage stress, mortgage rates and mortgage stress yet. So, um, Strong jobs is good, but uh, a lot of people borrowed up big time to buy places mm. at the top of the market a year or two ago who are now having to refinance from out of 2% into 6%. And that will hit a lot that, of people. And that wave rate. is coming this year. More than That's last a wave year, that happened this year. Yeah. A large lump of people borrowed fixed rates at literally 2%, 2.5% to 2020, 21, 22. They were one, two or three years, which is now due. So a lot of those will, most people can, uh, they've got a couple of jobs and they can, uh, they've got cash in the bank, there's still a lot of cash in the bank, spending is still strong. This year, will now being 2023, we'll see spending slow because that cash pile is running out and pressures from the pump mm. prices and pressures from mortgage rates rising will put a lot of households with debt under pressure. Will it result in a deep recession like the early 90s in Australia? Um, in pockets, it will. Um, one of the pockets that's early to go and has already started is about 20 or 30 national builders, uh, yeah. construction and building companies uh, have already been bankrupt. So they've been at the, the sharp year. end of it. They've dealt with the extreme inflation. That's right. Plus supplies. also when they go, all their suppliers go, mm. you know, plumbers and tradies and tilers who are relying on the cash, that's not going to be there. So that will filter through. Now, most countries, that's not a problem. In Australia, it's a very big sector of employment. That mm. trade sector, construction sector, is a very big marginal sector in Australia. So that will start to impact people uh, when mm. rates go up further, spending cuts further. Um, so I can see some stress, probably not in the early 90s, like recession. Now, all of that's going to occur even if the RBA doesn't do any more rate hikes. Mm. Um, if it, the RBA probably sitting at 3.1%, they will slow rate hikes or pause or perhaps even reverse, um, which is what the bond markets are saying they will do within a mm. year um, if there's any large scale mortgage stress and bankruptcy crisis and uh, unemployment crisis in Australia. I can see it, I can't see unemployment getting to seven, eight, nine, ten percent like it did very briefly 
in the GF in the in the GFC and also in the the COVID sell-off in 2020 in the US, it spiked to seven percent literally overnight. I can't see that happening as quickly this time. Mm. But governments haven't got the cash to spend to simply yeah. dole out money like they did last time. There's a little lessons from the from the COVID experience. I suspect governments a don't want to. They haven't got the willingness or ability to borrow like they did uh, only three years ago. So. Interesting time. So yes, and you're, you're painting a picture where last year was, I guess, stage one of this. This year is sort of stage two, where it begins to hit the main street more. The impact yep. of it starts to be felt more. How do you then relay that back to, I guess, portfolio construction and positioning? Um, given there, there's always risks in the world, yes. um, but I guess one positive in terms of where we sit today versus twelve months ago is the yields that you can now get on conservative assets at least are back to some form of normality. Markets have had. In particularly in global shares, some of the pricing uh, normalised, but you, are, you make the case that you know could certainly have further to go, uh, depending on the economic circumstances. Yes, How do you position a portfolio through this? We, are, we we've got a couple of things happening on the growth side or the risk side. Given that everything is risk, but the traditional risk side, which is shares and property, we have been uh, heavily weighted towards Australia. Now, Australia is 3% of the global share market, so a typical diversified portfolio should have a very much more global shares and Aussie shares. Mm-hmm. We have, I think, pretty much half-half. We've got uh, half our portfolio in Australian shares and diversified funds, and they've done, they've done pretty well in the main relative to global share markets. Um, so that's one thing we'll probably continue into next year, uh, this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, US market being global markets dominant, I suspect are still overpriced and still, and the lower yield, they're only yielding about 2%, which is not bad. Better than, now, in the dot com boom 20 years ago, mm-hmm. a US yield, a shares yielded 1%, and they were priced at P ratios, price earnings ratio of 50 times earnings. Now, US shares are paying 2% yield, and they're priced at around about. 20, 25 times earnings. So mm. it's about half the level of silly pricing as it was 20 years ago in the dot-com boom. Mm. So we haven't got that, that level of fluff in the market. Um, but relative on a relative value basis, Australian shares as a group yep. look pretty good globally. Um, so enough for you to retain a certain degree of caution about um, yep. international allocation. And then... On the defensive uh, side. On the defensive on side, On the yeah. so-called defensive side. Now, bear mm. in mind, bonds, which are... Uh, High-grade corporate government bonds had their worst year in 2022 in a century yeah. uh, for a whole lot of reasons because yields spiked. Uh, Interest rates went from zero yeah. to three to four. Yeah. Um, so that put to bed the idea they were defensive uh, or safe assets. Um, we had two thirds of our, alloc- our bond allocation out of bonds last year, so we didn't. We we missed most of that. Uh, we had it in high grade floating rate notes. Now the case for that is is strong now. Bonds are not going to spike, and the bond yields aren't going to spike two or three percent, which they did last year. Um, they now have scope to fall a couple of percent in a deep recession, which, like twenty twenty, they fell back to below one percent. Now they're sitting at around three, three and a half percent bonds around the world, except Japan. Um, cash, we liked cash uh, in a defensive scenario, but it paid zero for three years. Cash is now paying. You can get on a good quality cash cash account. You can get three and a half, four percent, just on no risk at all, government guaranteed. And on high grade floating rate notes, you can get a running yield, which is a cash yield every month, um, on an annual basis of around about four, five, six percent. So our cash side of the portfolio, floating rate side of the portfolio, is yielding four, five percent, which is good. Didn't get that mm-hmm. before, so that's a case to hold cash uh, or floating high floating grade rate, floating yeah. rate note. I'm still not uh, comfortable on the medium term with fixed rate bonds because even though they're now yielding three-ish percent, if you think about where inflation's going, inflation's not going to globally. It's not going to go back and settle neatly at target level. Yeah, you're probably going to have inflation at three or four-ish percent, which means bond yields in the medium term are going to be five or six percent. Where are they now? Three, three and a half percent, which means they've got they've got further to go. Yeah. So I suspect that as a medium term investment, fixed rate bonds are not going to be a happy. Just to rather stay biased to floating rate. Correct. And, and in terms of the allocations between sort of growth defensive, I guess we, we we review that over the course of the next few weeks. We're actually pretty neutral on yeah. the growth defensive uh, defensive split. Um, we're pretty neutral. Um, shares have come off globally. I can see more than likely in Australia shares will be positive year in 2023. Globally, which is US primarily, I suspect there's more downside to come in. Global, a lot of risks that might come out of the mm. woodwork for a whole lot of different angles. 
um, they're still expensive and therefore over the medium term probably poorer returns than good diversified Australian shares. Yeah. But look, we're reiterating, I guess, we're, we're at a relatively neutral stance, but with that defensive bi- uh, yep. that bias towards Australia, which we see is a more defensive area in this uncertain environment. A couple of other probably less immediately impacting portfolio decisions, but things going on in the world at the minute. Uh, Bank of Japan, uh, Japan for many years negligible in, in inflation, uh, yes. population decline, staggering levels of debt, but borrowing at minuscule rates. Now suddenly that possibly tide is turning. Yes, <laughs> Japan have been uh, um, basically dormant for thirty years since the literally the, the U.S. market, the, the, the um, Nikkei peaked at forty thousand point zero 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 on the last day of December in the eighties end of December 1989 and it's been a pretty much a downward slide ever since with some with some bumps along the way um, it has a lot of problems right it's the oldest population in the world mm. um, big pension uh, payment problems declining population declining workforce declining pay- taxpayer base that's been the case for a decade or so um, it was the first to uh, along with Europe tinkered with negative yields on bonds, mm-hmm. having banks having to actually charge people to put money in the bank. Um, all sorts of strange complications <laughs> that weren't thought through there. Um, biggest government debt load in the world per capita and per GDP uh, for the size of the pie that's got to pay for it. Um, they've had a negative, uh, they've had a sort of a 10 year bond peg at uh, 0.1% for several years. Um, they indicated about a month ago they're going to raise that to 0.5%. Um, that, and they've been trying, they're spending billions of dollars per day to buy up their own bonds to try and keep it low. Uh, will they run out of money? Now, Japan has a problem in that it's got a high level of government debt, highest in the world, um, on, a, on a range of metrics. The good thing they have is that it's, it's almost all owned internally in Japan. Mm. Uh, unlike the US, unlike Australia, where half it's owned by foreigners, US 70% is owned by foreigners. In Japan, it's like mum and dad in a household, which is heavily in debt, but mum owes the money for dad, or vice mm. versa. They can sit down at the kitchen table and say, right, let's cross that out and put some lines through those and just call it square. Japan has the ability to do that because it owns 95% of its own debt. Now, who will pay for that? The answer is that pensioners who are currently used to, you know, 100 yen a day, whatever their pension is, will have to accept probably a, a haircut of 20 or 30 percent of that pension for the rest of their lives. Mm. It'll be so. As, as, as some of those bonds that those pension schemes are invested in are written down. So They're written so down. So written down the, or written the, off. The, 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 it'll be an internal book entry across the kitchen table, and the creditor mm. is, the, is the pensioner, their future pensions, and they will have to accept a lower pension, which is lower standard living for the next 30 years of their so life. So you probably see that some of the, what's happened this week is, I guess, their, their interest rates started to get pushed up to around that, they're trying to defend it at that half a percent yep. mark. Yep. This is the beginning of that probably rationalisation reality process. But the difference with their, say, the UK problem six months ago, mm. when they tried to do, to, you know, uh, to borrow big to to, 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 to take on Take on the liquidity cut again, yeah. Um, the owners of those bonds are foreigners. Mm. The US has a problem potentially because the owners of their, the, the people that own their business, they own their country, are foreigners. Mm. And in the case of the US, it's, it's not just Japan and Korea, Taiwan, it's China in a big way, and they're an enemy. So it's, it's much more difficult. You can't sit around a kitchen table and just cross mm. off numbers. Mm. Uh, Japan will be solved internally around a kitchen table with the pension funds and the government and... Um, and the government-run pension funds, which mainly are the ones, the owners of their own bonds, it'll be sold with the book entry in the in the in the form of lower pensions ultimately because they mm-hmm. own the debt. Um, I don't see the US hitting a debt ceiling crisis or a yep. debt repayment crisis that everyone talks about. We've been through this dance a few times before. They're the uh, it's still the uh, the reserve currency of the world. Everyone has to own US dollars. Everyone has to go own US treasuries. Various people have threatened to sell treasuries. China has been selling treasuries for the last five years. They've sold down their three trillion dollars to two trillion dollars in US debt. The US is not going to default, and if they do, it won't be a. It'll be a temporary thing, solved internally, and it won't be a national or global crisis that people are worried about. Mm. Um, UK is a small; it's not important. So it's interesting because we're still a British colony. 
Um, but so it's interesting for us historically, but the UK is a small market player globally. Japan is not, but they can solve it internally. Mm. US is still the safe haven of the world, and everyone has to own US dollars. Mm. So they won't be a global systemic crisis. And they'll come to some agreement, as they've done many times before. Uh, not a million miles away across in China. A couple of significant yes. things there. One is... Uh, the reopening, so the movement, final movement on from their sort of zero COVID policy, which has really curtailed their economy for some time. So that's a big positive. And then second to that, uh, peak population, their mm. one child policy is finally. Yes, uh, one, of, one of the in, in the investment markets, um, most almost all things are unpredictable. Mm. Um, anything could happen tomorrow and it, and it will and it does. One of the great drivers of investment markets um, and economies and returns is extremely predictable, and that's population. If I'm, if, if a child is born today, yep. you can tell that in 10 years' time, it'll be more or less 10, and there's some mortality rate. In 20 years' time, there'll be more or less 20, and they're doing things, they're going to college and union, spending yep. in 30 should, years' time. You should enter the workforce so at a certain one point. of the great predictables, yep. which drives a lot of things people don't think about, is demographics. Uh, it's very predictable. So China's one-child policy in the 80s was always going to cripple it, and it's now crippling it. And it's now for a chi- this this year, well, at the end of December 2022, India, which is still growing rapidly, mm-hmm. overtook China as the most populous country in the world. So we're now we're now China num- China number two, India number one. That's got a lot of implications for the long term. Um, for Australia, it's not. There was a headline a couple of days ago in the AFR which said "Global Disaster: China's Stopped Growing." Um, they 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 like headlines that create disaster. I mean, if China was growing rapidly, they say oh, it's a it's a global crisis because they're going to take over the world. If they're contracting, it's also a global. So whatever they do, it's a global crisis mm-hmm. for headlines. Um, for Australia, will it mean our exports will stop? No, it won't. Mm. Um, Japan was Australia's biggest export partner from the mid '60s to. 2000. I thought you'd go back further than that and talk about their, their great trading relationship with Great Britain. Well, you know? Britain, 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 we, but Britain's died. Um, Japan took over yeah. as an M1 trading yeah. partner from 1965 until yeah. 2000, uh, when China took yeah. over. Yeah. Japan stopped growing dead and contracted, it's been contracting mm. ever since, since 30 years ago. But we still, so our, our number two trading partner is still Japan, mm. and we still is a number one, a number one or two seller or buyer of a whole bunch of stuff, mm. agricultural, mining, LNG, metals, iron ore, coking coal, thermal coal. Japan is still a great buyer of all those yeah. things from Australia, even though they died 30 so years ago. So you're saying it doesn't switch off overnight and gradually you diversify. Your There's actually a positive because as China slows, uh, which is unstoppable because the demographics mm-hmm. is predictable, the engine of growth in China has been construction. Yeah. With Declining economy, declining, um, declining um, economic growth population, taxpayer base, worker base, they will be more, they'll have to emphasise more construction, building of services, hospitals. They don't, they don't have pensions. They have virtually no hospitals. Well, you'd, you'd argue that the Silk Road is, is part of that as well. That's how they've sort of they've reached the max that they can need to do or productive to do internally. And they can, ex- can create multiple benefits by exporting that some of that production capacity. The Belt and Road's built by iron, ore and steel. What do we got? Iron, ore and steel Good for us. and all sorts of other metals. So I don't see the slowing of China or the decline mm. of China as being anything uh, like a crisis for Australia in the same way that the death of Japan 30 years ago had no effect, almost no effect on the expo- our exports to Japan. Mm. Um, so I don't see there's a problem. Will it change their outlook on the world? Probably not. They still have great plans to build a Belt and Road and have a strategic and military chain all the way into Africa, all the way into Europe. That's still going on. Uh, I don't see that changing. That's got to be built with metals and iron ore and steel from Australia, which we'll still export. Will they invade Australia? Probably not in the next year. Probably not in the next five years. They're not ready yet. Will there be a full-on war with the US? They're not ready yet. They know that. They don't want to do that. They're silly. I suspect over the longer term, something may develop. But Cold Wars can run for decades and then peacefully. Mm. Like the great Cold War in the 50s to the 80s, yeah. that ran for decades. There were hot wars at yeah. the periphery, Vietnam, yeah. Flash Korea, points, Cuban Missile um, Crisis. Yeah. But there was no major global war that we had. People worry about global warming now, which is obviously a concern and a, and a, um, a great concern for many people. 
they're worried about you know, temperatures rising by a degree or two in 50 mm. years. When I was, I'm old enough, when I was growing up, we were worried about temperatures rising 400 degrees in 10 seconds. That's what you call, that's called a global war. Mm. Um, will it occur in my lifetime? Probably yes. Will it occur in the next five or so years? Probably no. So that's interesting um, you, because you, you get into a spot there where anyone that's read your m- most recent monthly report published the first week of January, you talk about 20 risks that could occur, some from more likely to um, more, you know, not less likely in the short term at least, and, and, and the varying degrees of impact. Uh, not that we, we have time on the podcast to go through them all, but do you want to uh, talk about any particular favourites there? Well, I'll just show, I, I put it on a chart from the likelihood of occurring from very likely to very unlikely, um, and to the impact for investors on the, on the north-south scale. There's a lot of things that are very likely to occur with low impact for long-term investors. There are always going to be recessions. There's always going to be bankruptcies. There's always going to be collapses. There's always going to be wars somewhere. They're likely, very likely to occur, but the long-term impact on investors is pretty minor. Uh, you know, share prices drop, you just buy more. There's op- buying opportunities. Uh, plenty of things will occur which create opportunities to buy, which is actually a positive for long-term investing. Uh, on the other hand, you've got a few things which are devastating impact on everybody, like the meteor hitting or global war, etc., uh, like a real full-on global war that destroys all life on the planet. Mm. That will occur sometime in the future, but will it occur next month, next year, next five years? Probably not. So very high impact, but no very low li- likelihood. So. A lot, if you read the headlines and read a lot of blogs online, you get this impact that this impression that there's massive amount of major impacts that are going to happen next week or yeah. next month. There are things that will have a devastating impact on investors long term, but with almost negligible chance of occurring. Yeah. Uh, what gets the headlines are the things that we know will happen. There'll be recessions and sell-offs and all sorts of things, but they'll they'll occur. But are they going to affect impact long term investors? Mm-hmm. The answer is no. If anything, they present buying opportunities. Um, so it's very important to understand. The impact might be major, but the probability is very low, mm-hmm. and the other way around. Yeah. So that's all in that. Well, I encourage report. you all to, to have a read of it, and it includes everything from the, the death of the planet to, to major wars yep. and, and other sorts of things. Death of the planet so. is very likelihood in the long term, very high impact. Give it enough, but, give uh, it enough millennia that eventually we get correct. there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, as always, Ashley. Uh, entertaining and insightful. And Fantastic. thank you to all our listeners. Happy New Year. And, and good luck out there. We look forward to speaking again soon. Take care.